All right, good evening, everybody. We are looking at Luke chapter 11 tonight. And uh, we're going to be spending more time in the first 36 verses and beginning around verse 37 to the end of it. We're going to uh, do a little bit more survey of that uh, because there's some parallels there in Matthew 23. Um, and so it may be a little bit more familiar. But as we've been going through this, we've been trying to emphasize parts of this that are a little more unique to, to Luke. Um, we're going to look at some things that might be familiar to you from the Sermon on the Mount, but the way that Luke talks about this is going to be a little bit different. Um, and so that's what we're looking at for tonight. Just as we get started in Luke chapter 11, um, a, couple, a couple ways that we can think about the theme of this chapter as, as I'm thinking about this. This chapter emphasizes a lot your disposition towards God. And you're going to see a lot of different examples of this. You're going to see prideful stubbornness with the uh, Pharisees and the lawyers and the way that they're trying to argue with Jesus. There's going to be somebody that's insulted by something that Jesus says to him that he should have been humbled to receive. There are other people prayerfully seeking him. Uh, and then Jesus is going to challenge people to have a greater loyalty to him over tradition. And so th this is a, a big picture kind of idea that we're going to see in this chapter. And what Jesus is doing with his teaching is to condition our hearts to be calibrated to what he's looking for in us. In, uh, so that what he's, what he's looking for is what's in our heart. That's what his teaching is supposed to do for us. So what we're looking at tonight is the first 13 verses... Jesus is going to have instructions on how to pray. And then 14 to 36 is a series of like five smaller sections that all have the same commonality of spiritual warfare. There's going to be things about casting out demons and if a demon returns to a house that's been swept up. And uh, all this stuff deals with this spiritual battle that we have. And then the end of the chapter, you have the woes to the Pharisees and the lawyers. And so that's what we're looking at tonight Let's go ahead and get started in chapter 13, and we'll read verses, let's do verses 1 through 4 to get us started. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, starting in verse 5, we'll look at that in just a moment. Jesus is going to emphasize the persistence in prayer. But one of the themes that we've been seeing in the Gospel of Luke is Jesus praying. We've seen it in chapter 3, 5, 6, 9, a couple times in chapter 9. And here he is praying again, and you guys have probably all heard the point, everybody who's ever preached a sermon on this part of Luke will always say that the disciples never asked Jesus, how do we cast out demons? They never said, how do we preach better sermons? But they did ask, how do we, ca how do we pray like you pray? And so there was something about the way that Jesus prayed, his methodology, the things he said in his prayers that struck them. And so the way that we look at verses 2 through 4, the way that I think about this is it's like a tuning fork. Uh, why do you use a tuning fork? Yeah, to be in tune, to like make sure that we're kind of in the range of what we're singing. We got the same note and everything. I look at what Jesus is doing in verses 2 through 4 here to say, are your prayers in line with this kind of model? Not so much that you just mindlessly say this prayer again and again and again, though I don't think it would be a bad thing from time to time to just recite this prayer, but that you're not just constantly doing this all the time without thinking about what it is. Uh, so look, look at this question. How does Jesus' response in the Lord's Prayer uh, guide our own approach to prayer? Yeah, it's a template. What else could we say about this? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, like beginning with acknowledge, hallowed be your name. Like you are great and before you I'm nothing. But by your grace you take care of me and, I, and you're willing to listen to my prayers for forgiveness of sins. And you know, the biggest thing that I'm concerned about is your kingdom coming. Now, I will say about that, there's some people that would say, well, the kingdom came in Acts chapter 2, so we shouldn't pray this part of the prayer anymore, which I disagree with. The word kingdom and the concept of kingdom means the rule of God, the reign of God. And so what would it mean your kingdom come? Well, may your borders expand. May the borders of your kingdom expand as more and more hearts are conquered for the gospel. May your kingdom come into the hearts of men. May your rule and their submission to that come into the hearts of men. I think that that's kind of the idea that he's saying. So your name is great. May everybody come to know that greater and greater. Uh, yeah, hand over here. Right. Yes, and, and let's, let's tack this other question on here and, and kind of go between them if we want to. But Jesus emphasizes the importance of approaching God as a loving father. You see it in verse 2, we'll see it in verse 11. How does this understanding of God as our father impact our prayers and our relationship with him? Yeah, so if he's our father, we can be personal and open with him. We can know that he cares for us. He wants what's best for us. Wes? Or the analogy that you were trying to make a union with like right in that church, I mean, virtually impossible for one of those three things. But if, if right in that church, God opens to come in and see it again and say, hey, Dad, it's cool. Hey, you got me under that anointing. Right. Yeah, if he's our father, we have access to him. Um, you don't have access to Elon Musk and just call him up, hey, like, hey, can I have a cool mill or something like that? Like he, if you, but if you're his child, he'll talk to you. Like he's our father. We, we can go to the creator of the universe and like a good father, he will want to bless you and help you and he'll say more things about this in the next part of this. But I think the fatherhood of God, I'm, I'm fixing to do a sermon on that sometime soon. Um, on the fatherhood of God and, and us being adopted as children. There's a text in Galatians that's very rich, and I've been trying to think about it for a couple weeks now to get, eventually get a sermon on it. And I've been trying to think more about this idea of what it means that we're children of God. One of them at least means this. If you really understand God as being your father, and you understand that an eight-year-old, a five-year-old would talk to their father and ask for things and help and you know, all this kind of stuff, how much are we praying and this is in the context of how to pray. Um, notice another thing about this prayer, though. Uh, give us our daily bread. Like, a lot of the concern of this prayer is spiritual in nature. He does, he does say, give us our daily bread. We've got physical needs. Third John talks about praying that um, Gaius' health may go well with him as it goes well with your soul. But most of the prayers in the Bible are for things that are spiritual in nature in the New, in the New Testament. How often does that get reflected in our public prayers? And that's just something to, to think about, but Jesus' prayers here are, are emphasized in that kind of way. But, um, all right, let's round this part out on how to pray. I'm going to put the question up uh, about verses 5 through 13, and then I'm going to read the text. But here's the question that I want us to think about with verses 5 to 13. Jesus teaches about the importance of persistence in prayer using the example of a friend asking for bread at midnight. How does this parable illustrate the importance of persistence? How can we continue to pray and trust God even when we don't see immediate answers? So let's read verses 5 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, 
Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and, it, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All right. What it, when you look at parables, there's parts of the parables that um, I don't think have some kind of correlation to God's nature, and there's parts of it that we apply. So, for example, if you pray to God for something and you just keep bothering him, it's not saying, well, he'll finally give it to you, not because you're a friend of his or because he's your father, but because of your persistence, you just annoyed him so much. I, he's using an earthly example to show the importance of you just keep praying, praying, praying. But what do you guys think about this question here? How does this parable illustrate the importance of persistence? Yeah. Yes. Um, good. What else? There's a saying about that if you had the day that you have today, or yesterday, the day you have today, and then today and all the important other things you're doing, a lot of times the day that you're not fighting with me, you would put many times in the day that you're praying for the people that put a lot of time in the day praying. Right. Yeah, keep the communication going even when, like, I feel like I've been praying for this a lot and it's not happened yet, but you, you wait and maybe sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no, but Amy, over here. Yeah, good, good. And, and even though you haven't received it yet, you're still maintaining that it's a good thing or it's something that you, that you trust that in one way or another because even though I haven't received it yet, God in his good timing may eventually bless me with this thing or that thing or whatever it might be good. What else? Yeah. Yeah, good. Like thanking God for answered prayer. And I think even thanking God for, for unanswered prayers. Like, let, like or when the answer has been no. What if God said yes to everything you ever asked him for? my life would be a wreck. Like, we should be thankful even for the prayers that God has not said yes to because he knows much better than we do. And so sometimes we might be praying, praying, praying. We haven't gotten some answer that we're looking for yet. Maybe it's because you're not ready to have that thing you've been praying for. Or maybe it's because you're not even wise enough to know that you shouldn't have been asking for that to begin with. So you, tr you entrust things to the Lord and he'll give you good things. You've just got to trust that about him. Anything else you want to say about that? So what are the kinds of things that we can pray for and have confidence that God is going to grant it to us? Yeah, yeah wisdom what? Daily bread. Okay, so, some of you have heard me use this illustration. I know the college students have heard me use this illustration before, but I'll use it again. So um, if my kids come to me asking for ice cream... Dad, is it your will that I have ice cream right now? Well, it depends on a lot of variables. Is it really close to bedtime? Have you brushed your teeth already? Have you been a good little boy or girl? It, there's a lot of variables in play. But if they come saying, hey, can we have carrots and celery and broccoli? Like, yeah, I'll keep shoveling it out to you because that's good for you. You can have as much of that as you want. There's no limit to how much of that you can have. And so when we come to God praying for things that we know he wants for us, wisdom, wisdom, character, um, 
that we would have deeper spiritual insight. Things like, we know he'll say yes to that, but there's other things that might be more circumstantial. God, give me a spouse. God, give me a child. Why don't I have these things yet? Well, there might be things that you don't understand right now, and it's good that, that you don't have that at this point in your life, or whatever. There, there's a lot of things that... or. It, there's a lot of things that we don't know the answer to in that way. But the things that we know he'll say yes to are the things that we see in Scripture. So ask yourself this question. How often are your prayers informed by the Scripture? That's one of the reasons that I've been trying to end these classes with prayers based on the things that we've studied in the class. Because if we're the ones dictating everything we want to pray about, oftentimes we just lean towards all things that are just physical, which is not wrong in and of itself, but if that's all we ever pray for, we're not praying in line with what God has revealed in the Scripture. So anything else you guys want to say about the persistence? And of course, we all have to challenge ourselves and ask ourselves, what is our prayer life? Are we consistently going to the Lord in prayer? Are we getting so discouraged that we've stopped praying? Amy? Right. Right. Yes. Good. Yep, good. LR? Right. Yeah, good. Good. All right. Uh, there'll, there'll be some more things to say about prayer at other points in, in Luke as well. Uh, but just ask yourself if verses 2 through 4 sound generally like how you pray. You start out with God's greatness, and then you move towards his concerns for the world, that his kingdom would expand and grow. You go towards your concern for the things that you need. You go towards your need for the forgiveness of sins and God protecting you from sinning. What are your weak points? Are you asking God to help you with those kinds of things? So, um, all right. Let's, so from verses 14 to 36, you've got these little vignettes, these little sections that have this commonality of spiritual warfare. Jesus is going to be casting out demons, and then there's going to be this, this couple verses about this house that's uh, swept out. The demons are... T and I want to spend a lot of time talking about that tonight, actually. Um, and it's overtaken by more demons. And then uh, the shallow sense of blessedness with somebody that blesses Mary because she got to breastfeed Jesus. And uh, people seeking a sign. And I as a lamp to the body. All of these things have to do with, and Jesus, I think, summarizes a lot of this in verses 33 to 36. Like, what is it that you're perceiving and understanding in the world? And if your understanding is, is dark, it has more to do with your morality than your intellect. And so, it, so let's go ahead and um, start out we're not going to spend as much time on this first one. What happens in verses 14 through 23 is somebody comes up to Jesus with an accusation that you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. In other words, uh, I want to take this great thing, that, which is the prince of the demons. It's, uh, a lot of people say that's another term for Satan. It's not good. So this good thing that you're doing, Jesus, it's actually by the power of demonic beings and not actually God working through you or the spirit working through you. And so they, notice that the, the detractors of Jesus believe that Jesus can cast out demons. They're just questioning the power by which it's happening which is an interesting thing that even the skeptics of Jesus still understood his power. 
And so Jesus' response is, is, this is where we get the famous, a house divided can't stand, and if a house is divided, then that kingdom's falling apart anyways, so if Satan is casting out Satan, then it looks like Satan's demise is coming to an end one way or another. But look at what he says. I'll just, I'll just point out a couple things that Jesus says here. Look at verse 20. No, start in verse 19. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When Jesus says this comment about their sons casting out demons, I wonder if some of these people that are questioning Jesus, remember the 70 he just sent out in chapter 10? Are some of those 70 children of these opponents of Jesus? Like, it seems like... He says your children are, or unless he's talking to just really older people, and some of your your children Israelites are casting out demons. But I wonder if it's even biologically the case, and kind of like, you know, rubbing salt in the wound it would feel like to those people. But Jesus is saying that casting out demons is evidence of what in verse 20? The kingdom is coming. And so again, what does kingdom mean? The domain of the king. Kingdom, king, and domain. Kingdom. So you've got a king and his domain. And here you've got Jesus' kingdom is coming, and the evidence of this, the evidence of his power and his reign and his rulership, is that he's casting out demons. It looks like this kingdom's more powerful than the kingdoms of Satan. And so he brings that up to them and he talks about how he's coming and he's binding up. Uh, the strong man, he's the stronger one, binding up these people, and he's taking back what belongs to him, comparing himself to a righteous robber. Uh, Ironically, later on, Jesus is crucified between two robbers. I would argue that Jesus was the thief on the cross. He compares himself to a a robber here. He was the one who stole the thief on the cross back from Satan. So isn't that cool, you know? All right, um, anything you guys want to say about that? Mark has this account... Matthew has this account, and so I want to get to this other part that is uh, only in Matthew, but the way that it's talked about here I think is a little different. All right, look at verses 24 to 26. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Okay, um, this is the account, I don't think Matthew's account says this. But this is the account that says that these demons, they get cast out of this house, and it travels through waterless places. What do you think that means? What was that? Yeah, I think, it, yeah, there's a couple different ideas of this. Is it the case that demons are really scared of water, making it really funny and ironic that when Jesus cast the pigs into the sea, they're like, oh, no, water, like they really hate baptism. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I don't know it's so much that, but it's that they're finding unpopulated areas where there's not water. And, peop- and so they, they travel through all these desert lands and they can't find rest because they can't find people to, to hop on into. And so they're like, well, you know, I, we were cast out of that one place the one time. We were evicted. But how about we go ahead and go back? What's the point of this little story? Yeah, Wes? Wes? Right. And so, so you, ca- you, you cast the demon out, you get the bad influence out, and it's going to do everything it can to try to get back in. What were you going to say, Wes? Just the idea that um, they, they were cast out, they were put in order, but nothing could be replaced. Yes. And then that way, when someone comes back, it's like a treasure trove. Yes. And so we can say it this way. Religion that only says no creates horrors. If, if, you, if your perception of what preaching should be and your perception of raising your children is always just, no, 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 no. 
What can that create? It, rebellious Christian, people that have rebelled against Christianity, rebellious people, and so he, so the house is swept, it's put in order, like it's just like, no, 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 nothing over here, nothing like very clean, everything like that. Okay, house, what are you proactively doing? All we know is what's been swept away and cleaned up. You know, you stopped watching those bad movies. You stopped using those bad words. You stopped going and hanging out with those people. All right, so you're a real Christian now, right? Because because you just know all the things you can't do. Um, for every put off, there's a put on. Put away lying, speak the truth. Put away laziness and work so as to have something to give to somebody. The section in Ephesians Four that talks about the put off, put on. For everything you're supposed to take out of your life, there's something to fill it with. So like when I used to drink a lot of coffee, I haven't had coffee now in like two years because I replaced it with mud water, which is like a mushroom powder mix and stuff, and it's really good for you. And so um, I wouldn't have been able to overcome the power of coffee unless I had the power of the mushroom drink. For example, and so whatever, whatever vice you're working on, whatever it is in your life that needs to get out of your life, have you thought about what it needs to be replaced with? And if your conception of serving God is, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do that. Okay, you just give it a couple months, and seven demons are going to come into you, and you're going to be worse than any atheist you've ever met. Why is it the case that sometimes religious people can sometimes be so overcome and so deluded and not understand the wickedness that they have. Yes. Right, if you're just focused on how people perceive you rather than being a person of substance, if you're in, in, in he's driving at, he's going to be hitting on, the, hitting on the, the negative things of the Pharisees and lawyers in just a moment, and it'll tie into this. Anthony? Yes. Yeah, and think about um are, are there certain false doctrines you've heard? Okay, okay, like let me just give you this example. Let's say that somebody is going like, hey, Ephesians chapter one says that we've been predestined for adoption as sons. What do you think that's talking about? Well, it doesn't mean this, and it doesn't mean Calvinism is true, and it doesn't mean this, and doesn't mean that. All right? What does it mean? Has it caused you to rejoice ever? Has it ever brought uh, happiness to your heart that whatever that means has transformed you in some way? If there are doctrines and, and passages that the only thing you've ever done to is react and go, well, it doesn't mean that. Okay. Have you ever figured out what it does mean? Any of you learned to rejoice in that? And if not, at least in that particular way, you're liable to be the person that's just cleaned things up. Let's get the false doctrine out, but we don't know what this actually means to be rejoicing in it. Brian? It's got to be filled with something.
Yes. Yeah, and so that means that even morally speaking, you can get certain things morally out of your life, but still not have really invited Jesus in. So, which is a scary idea. All right, I got a couple hands. Amy, and then, yeah. Right. And why wouldn't we want him in our life then? Right. Over here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, good, like, yeah, I don't do this, I cleaned up and everything, but, like, is Jesus really in there? Well, well, look what I don't do. That's not good enough. Andrew, and then a hand over here. So, I think that Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 pretty clear is a picture of what we need to build the house with instead of um, just getting rid of the things. Yeah, don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Exactly, do not get drunk with wine, for that that is debauchery, but we get filled with the Spirit. Yeah. Right, good, good. Over Yeah, good. So you're, you, God wants, he doesn't want to just tell us what not to do, but he wants to instill virtues. Like proactive kindness, proactive loving, proactive sacrifice. Pro, like what proactive things have you been learning in the last six months? What things have you said to yourself, hey, I want to learn more about how to get better, not just with putting something off, but proactively doing this. Hey, I want to get better at figuring out what my gift is so I can serve the Lord and help the the local church more. I want to figure out, like, who is it at church that needs encouragement right now? What what have you been doing in the last six months that you've been more thoughtful about that you can say, I'm proactively trying to figure this out? And that's, that's what people who truly let Jesus into their life are doing. So, um... All right, let's, let's go ahead, let's move on. Um, look at verses 27 and 28. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Um, okay, so maybe a passage like this warns against venerating Mary. Like here's a woman that's saying like, Wow, Mary is just super duper blessed, isn't she? Uh, and she is blessed. That's what Luke chapters 1 and 2 teach us. But he says, yeah, but the thing that you need to be most concerned about it is uh, obedience. Like hear, hearing and listening. Um, and so I don't have much else to say about that other than sometimes we can have a shallow sense of what it would mean to be blessed. And blessing comes from listening and doing proactively, not just putting off things like we just talked about. But anything you guys want to say about that? All right, Um, look at verses 29 to 32. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. Uh, By the way, can you imagine, like a crowd keeps coming up to him. Imagine that on some Sunday morning, we got like a bigger crowd than we've ever had, a bunch of people from the community, and then somebody gets up in the pulpit, let's just say it was me, and I said, all right, everybody, 
All of you are evil. Welcome to the West End Church of Christ. (laughs) Why does he do this? It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. All right. Notice that for these people, they're seeking after signs. In Mark's account, they're saying, we want a sign from heaven. Well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is the sign from heaven. But I think what they're saying is, yeah, we've seen you multiply the bread. We've seen you calm a storm. But do something in outer space, like make the stars align. Like do something like that, because we're just not getting enough evidence. Um, Reminds me of certain people that I've studied with, especially when I would study with atheists in Atlanta, um, it, it's, it's not an intellectual problem. What this is is a heart problem. You, there's all kinds of evidence right in front of you. Um, and so if people want to find some reason to discredit the Scripture and discredit God because really there, there's some immoral activity that they want to be involved in or something like that, then there's always going to be something, well, you know, I just don't know. You know, extraordinary claims need, need extraordinary evidence. Okay, well, what would you define as extraordinary evidence? Well, if God appeared right in front of me, okay, well, you're a committed atheist who believes that there is no supernatural. So if God did appear right in front of you because of your worldview, you would have to conclude that there was some kind of physical explanation for what just happened rather than a supernatural one, ergo, you're not really open anyways. Did you guys catch all that? So, um, you can give evidence after evidence after evidence, but if your heart doesn't want to believe it, it will always say, well, I need more, you know, I just need more. Um, Jesus says that they will be given one sign. What sign is it? Sign of Jonah. Can you imagine... You know, Jonah, three days in the fish. Imagine like that, how sick that fish would have felt. And it's like, blah, you know, it throws up and he, he flies up onto the beach. And he maybe some people have speculated that he would have looked bleached from the stomach acids of the fish. I don't know. But here's this guy that's like, hey, like the fishermen, you know, like, we saw this guy get vomited out of, out of a fish. And now he's walking around the city preaching to us. So, Whoa, that's crazy. Like, we better listen to that, dude. Anybody that gets vomited out of a fish, we better listen to. And Jesus is saying, Nineveh repented at something less than what you have right now. And people like the Queen of the South, the the Queen of Sheba, she came from Ethiopia and listened to Solomon's wisdom. And you guys have something greater than Jonah. You guys have something greater than Solomon, and you aren't listening. And so, yeah, you'll get the sign of Jonah. I'm going to be raised after three days, a greater resurrection than Jonah ever had, and we'll see if you listen then, and some people end up doing that. But the expectation that Jesus puts on people that live in this covenant is higher. People in the old covenant didn't have what we have. We have seen the panoramic picture of Jesus. Could it be the case that the people of Nineveh and on Judgment Day could rise up and go, what's wrong with you guys? We, we had a guy vomited out of a fish. You guys had somebody rise from the dead who also did a bunch of miracles and preached a lot more than just, in yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. You had somebody that revealed so much more than Jonah ever did, and we got it. What was wrong with you guys? Scary to think about these people in the Old Testament that had a very narrow understanding of God compared to us and how those people could be used as further justification of our condemnation. Any thoughts or comments on that? Or I got this question here. What, what, uh, what is it? Oh, I just, I just answered that question. Man, sorry. All right. Anything else you guys want to say up to verse 32? Yeah. Yeah, good. Good. Um, 
No, you wouldn't. Because people saw his miracles and they didn't believe. It, it, this is always a heart issue. Because Jesus ends up telling you that you got to put things out of your life that you kind of mean a lot to you. And you're too attached to these sins. And so he's giving you evidence, yeah. And if you really care about evidence, you'll let the evidence go where, where it'll lead you. But there's a lot more going on here than just strict in intellect. Dylan? Yes. Yeah, like, the, the, can you imagine how insulting this potentially could have been to these, these Jewish people? Nineveh, Gentile, the queen of the south, queen of Sheba, from Ethiopia. Gentile people who understood things that you guys should have understood. Could it be the case that somebody in the city of Bowling Green gets taught the gospel at some point in the next couple of years, and they come in, and they start learning and growing, and it's like they start understanding way more than you ever did, and you're kind of like, well, what's this all about? Like, the, and, then, and then that person's being venerated and honored more than you, even though you've been a member here for 6,000 years, and like, what, this, this ain't fair. Can you imagine Jesus walking around praising Gentiles? More, and he's railing on these Jews who should have known better. So anything else you guys want to say about that? All right, um, verses 33 to 36 just talk about the, the, the idea of this is that your eye is compared to, to a lamp, and if you have a good eye that wants the truth, it will illuminate yourself. If you don't have a good eye, um, then everything that you understand will be darkness. So much of what we understand comes down to what your desires are and not your intellect. If you want to know the word of God, you can know it. If there are sins that you like to commit that make you afraid to study the Bible and you don't have the courage to overcome that fear, you just won't be somebody who gets it. And so, uh, but we looked at something similar to that earlier, I think in Mark 6. But I want to end with this part. In 37 to 54, Jesus gives these woes or these judgments on first the Pharisees and then the lawyers. He talks about how they cleanse the exterior, but inwardly they're dead. Uh, the, the imbalance that they have, they have pride issues, they're spreading uncleanness to other people, they're giving people impossible demands that they themselves aren't carrying, they rejected the prophets of old, even though they, they would talk as if, you know, oh yeah, Jeremiah, he was a great man, great man, but if you lived back then, you would have been one of the ones throwing him in a cistern. Um, they've taken away the key of knowledge, they've so obscured the truth in the teaching that they do that they're, they're, they're shutting people out from the kingdom. But notice that in verse 37, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went and reclined at table. Je this is all in the context of Jesus having dinner at somebody's house. Can you imagine the mood that he's killing right now? Hey, come over for dinner, all right? And let me tell all of you how bad you are. And they notice that he doesn't ritually wash before eating, 25% of the Jewish Mishnah is about ritual washing, and Jesus is like sitting there, and they're like, everybody's like dipping their hand in bowls in this ritual way, and Jesus is just sitting there like, all right, when are we going to pray for the food? I'm not doing that. Uh, and so this gets them upset at him, and so uh, Jesus is, he just starts challenging them in all these ways. One, in verse 45, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And Jesus, of course, says, I'm so sorry about that. I didn't mean that. No, he just doubles down and he gives these people these other woes. Who is Jesus the hardest in, on in the scriptures? Religious people who should have known better. Most judgments in the New Testament are against religious people who should have known better. Religious people who studied their Bibles, but they missed the heart of what God was commanding. Religious people who maybe just wanted the heart of what God commanded, but not doing what he actually said. You can be wrong in both ways, by adding to or taking away. And Jesus rails on this kind of thing. And so, um, any comments or questions on that? All right. That is the class for tonight, then. Lord willing, on Sunday... Um, you guys will be looking at Luke chapter 12.